I really want to spend some quality time with e each and every one of you and um, just share some moments that we'll never forget. <laughs> The slasher genre of movies has existed for many years and has produced classics such as Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The success of these pioneer movies led to a huge surge of them, causing a bit of oversaturation in the industry. However, in the early 2010s there was another medium with little to no content that mimicked a slasher film, video games. Supermassive Games, a company that was small at the time, known for working on Little Big Planet DLC and other small projects, had an idea for a new interactive drama based on a slasher film using the PlayStation Move controller. Little did Supermassive know, the release of Until Dawn would shoot them into stardom when the game sold way more than anybody expected. For this video, I have a bigger disclaimer than normal to put at the beginning. Like always, there's gonna be a lot of spoilers, so I recommend playing the game before watching this video. I'm also going to apologize ahead of time for any stuttering or weird mistakes, I'm still an amateur at this video documentary stuff. A big point that I have to bring up for this video is that Until Dawn has a lot of different endings and choices that significantly change the game. I will be talking about my experience in this video, although I may bring up the alternate choices every once in a while if I find them important enough, especially if they cause a big change in the story. One more thing, this is not an easy video for me to make script wise. The game is totally outside of my range of experience since there are basically 8 main characters that require a lot of explanation and describing, so I'm sorry if the video doesn't feel as tightly wound when it comes to pacing or explanations. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about Until Dawn's interesting development. Up until the release of Until Dawn, Supermassive Games really hadn't done all that much. They were a very new studio, and they didn't even work on significant new games, instead working on DLC for the Little Big Planet series and a strange party game called Start the Party that utilized the PS3 motion controllers. If you don't know, the PlayStation Move controller was made for the PlayStation 3, and it was basically a more powerful Wiimote that used a camera for full body tracking. Supermassive was founded in 2008, and clearly their goal was to make a few small games or DLC like this so they could eventually make their own IP. Presumably because of their previous experience with the PS Move, Supermassive Games believed they could create an experience using this technology for the PS3. The game would be in first person, and it required players to make certain motions with the Move controller to complete tasks and puzzles. The developers quickly realized that using a niche technology as the basis for the game cut off a huge amount of casual players who didn't have or want the product from being able to play their game. So with Sony's permission, Supermassive switched the game's development to the PS4 and completely dropped the use of the PlayStation Move controller. Around this time, the game was also changed to a third-person experience, which made things feel much more cinematic overall, and because of this, the developers changed the genre from horror-adventure to horror-drama, while also giving the game a more mature tone. Supermassive decided the game needed better graphics as well, and after hiring some better known actors, they used motion capture for the animations in the game rather than creating the animation themselves. There were a few different trailers for the game that came out, with the announcement trailer originally stating that the game would release in 2013. Yeah, so that didn't happen. Instead the game had a trailer in April 2014, and a launch trailer that came out at the same time that the game released on August 25th, 2015. While neither trailer is anything too crazy, it's important to note that they do feel very movie-like, again showing how much this game was trying to emulate slasher films. They have the same format as horror movie trailers where they cut between conflict scenes while putting text in between, and the launch trailer even has a narrator that honestly sounds kinda hilarious. Until dawn, only your choices determine who will survive. Exclusively on PS4. With the launch trailer and the game both released to the public, it was time to see what the world thought of Supermassive Games' first significant title. Even though the sales figures for Until Dawn were never released, we can tell by how the game spread like wildfire that it did pretty well. Critics were eating it up, giving it mostly positive reviews all around. A huge platform that helped the game was YouTube, 
Only a few days after the game came out, videos were coming out from Markiplier, Jacksepticeye, Cub Scouts, and a ton more people who were all saying how cool this new interactive game was. This can be a good thing and a bad thing for a game. It can help promote the game like crazy and help with sales, but at the same time, a lot of people would just rather watch a YouTube video on the game and decide not to buy it for themselves. Either way, its YouTube stardom helped it to be the talk of the town for a good while after it came out, but what was in the game that specifically jumped out to people? The first thing I want to bring up is the soundtrack, as I feel like it's especially slept on. It's all composed by Jason Graves, and while I haven't listened to too much of it, the music is honestly really cool. It sounds almost fantasy-like, even with the intense music, and like the rest of the game, the score also feels like it could be made for a movie instead of a game. During exploration and calm moments, it has this mystical feel, kind of like you're exploring somewhere that you shouldn't be, giving you just this feeling of excitement, and the intense music that plays during conflict feels epic while also being kind of scary. It feels like a chase scene in a movie, like a Harry Potter broomstick chase, but with a tad bit of horror mixed into it. Of course, like all interactive dramas, Until Dawn has pretty simple gameplay. The game is in third person, but with set camera angles like you'd see in the early Resident Evil games. The player can control movement of the character with the left stick, and the character's head with the right stick that usually moves a flashlight around as well. By looking around, you can find different interactable items that only appear if your character is looking in the direction of the item, and when you pick it up, you can move it around the character's hand, which is a neat little addition that makes the interaction feel more real. Even though Until Dawn is very dialogue and character focused, you can't choose specific response options like The Walking Dead, instead choosing a way to respond. You'll get to choose between an intensity or type of response such as insisting or explaining and agreeing or persisting, and other choices that are similar. You won't know exactly what your character is going to say, even with the little description under the choice, but it does simplify the choices by showing what the dialogue is saying overall. Sometimes after dialogue, a menu page on your character will be updated, showing different personality traits or relationships with other characters being updated based on your choice. Honestly, I never found this to be all that important, except for maybe one time when I actually saw a relation status make a difference on a choice, but maybe I just missed them in my playthrough. On top of these dialogue options, there are also game-altering choices that change the story, and the choices that are especially important cause something called the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is a menu in the game that shows all of your choices in a cause-effect format, so when you make an important choice, it will appear in this menu, eventually being updated to show the effect when you run into it in the game. This is super cool, because it shows exactly what your choices are doing, and it gives you an idea of what choices you might have to change in another playthrough to get a different outcome. Speaking of outcomes, this game has a lot of different endings with slight variations, basically being the characters that you kept alive through the whole game. As you play through the game, your control will be switched between 8 different characters that all have different personalities, and because of this the game can switch between multiple events that are happening at once in different perspectives. There are a whole bunch of ways that characters can die throughout the game. You might be able to choose to kill another character, you can make a bad decision that gets your character killed, or you could fail a quick time event. Ah yes, quick time events. Every interactive game's favorite type of gameplay. If you don't know what they are, different button prompts will appear on the screen that require the player to press the button in a timely manner to succeed. This is basically the game's chase scene gameplay, and while it's definitely not the most in-depth, it has a little bit more to it than something like The Walking Dead. Occasionally choices will appear within a quick time event chase scene like taking a shorter riskier path or a longer safer path, and this really makes it feel like you're making split second decisions just like the character would have to. All of the quick time events are things that have been seen in other games, but a notable one that I've only seen in Until Dawn is the Stay Still event. This will appear when you're trying to hide from something, and it requires the player to keep the controller completely still to complete the action. It's surprisingly difficult not to mess these up, but they are pretty cool because once again it puts the player in the shoes of the character. You can also wield a weapon every once in a while, but the gunplay is nothing special as it's basically just another quick time event. Graphically, Until Dawn is kind of awesome. I wasn't expecting such a good looking game when I played it, and it holds up surprisingly well to this day. The character models are where it really shines. They nail the details of what faces and skin looks like, and the expressions are pretty top notch as well. The motion capture also looks pretty great. It allows for subtle movements that can add a lot of detail to the characters. Supermassive was pretty smart with their lighting and framing when they made the locations, as your vision is usually impaired by darkness or snow. 
Because of this, they can hide a lot of the muddier textures that occasionally shine through, and it also creates a super cool atmosphere of a little creepy and a little fantastical. The absolute worst thing about this game graphically is the performance. My god does this game have performance issues. Framerate wise, it's locked at 30 FPS, which wouldn't be that much of a problem if it was actually hitting 30 FPS. The game mostly plays at around 20 FPS, and it probably drops close to 15 in the more performance heavy moments. I understand why the game runs poorly because the graphics are pretty intense for the PS4 in 2015, but man I wish they were able to optimize it a little better. Style wise, the game is definitely stylized realism. It's one of those games that at first glance looks pretty realistic until you realize that's not what real life looks like. While it looks realistic, the style makes it look imaginative and the moonlit colors make it a bit eerie as well. I do think the style is perfect for this game because I feel like it encapsulates that teen slasher drama look where things just look a little bit off and you know something's gonna go wrong eventually. Now just like with all of these narrative focused games, it's time to get into the meat of the game, the story. Until Dawn first puts the player into a prologue before actually getting started with the story, and it shows us the cause of the rest of the game's events. It starts with a big group of friends in a cabin, all talking about some kind of prank that they're going to pull on their friend. Basically, the girl named Hannah in their group has a huge crush on this guy named Michael, so they're going to prank her by having Mike trick her into thinking he's into her, and of course they're going to get it all on camera. Beth, Hannah's twin sister, is controlled by the player right now, and she notices that something is going to happen to her sister. Beth and Hannah also have a brother, but he's currently passed out on the counter, so Beth goes to investigate on her own. The prank quickly goes wrong when Hannah realizes what's going on, causing her to run out of the building in tears. Oh my god, she's taking her shirt off. What? Oh my god! Matt? Hey, it's all good Matt, just a stupid prank. Uh, oh, hey. You guys are jerks. You know that? Hannah Beth sees this and goes after her in the blizzard, and the rest of the group stays behind. And what's especially interesting is that the rest of the group doesn't even think that the prank was that bad. As far as pranks go, this one is pretty messed up and super embarrassing for the person that gets pranked. Beth does describe Hannah as naive, so it's possible that she's the punching bag of the group that gets picked on a lot. As Beth runs after Hannah, the player can pick up a Native American like totem, and these totems are a pretty interesting gameplay mechanic. There are different types of totems, and when you pick them up they'll show you a short video clip of an event that could take place in the future. There are ones that will show you a possible death of your character or another character, and there are some that give you a guidance on a choice that you should make. You can avoid the outcome of these totems by altering your choices, and it's a super cool way to give the player a better chance of keeping the characters alive. Beth does end up finding Hannah, but they quickly realize that they're being chased by somebody. They get chased to the edge of a cliff, and after slipping off they barely hang onto a branch. The killer comes to the edge and holds his hand out to him, which is kinda strange but it'll make more sense by the end of the video. The twins drop off of the branch and fall to their death, and the game fades to black. The scene transitions to a strange office where there's a man named Dr. Hill who seems to talk directly to the player. He explains that your choices for the prologue didn't matter, but in the future everything you do will affect something. You see, no one can change what happened last year. The past is beyond our control. You have to accept this in order to move forward. But there is freedom in this revelation. Everything you do, every decision you make from now on will open doors to the future. This feels like a huge fourth wall break as he talks about you playing a game and making choices. He gives the player an exercise to do that involves picking what emotion a certain picture invokes, and from your responses, Dr. Hill will make conclusions on your personality. These little therapy sessions happen between almost every chapter, and they do a great job of giving the player a break from the story while also keeping the creepy tone of the game. It really helps that Peter Stormar's performance as Dr. Hill is incredible. He feels so creepy, it's like he really is evaluating you the whole time. Once you finish therapy, the game cuts to a year after the twin's death, and we see one of the friends who were there that night, Sam, riding a bus to the lodge while watching a message from Josh, the twin's brother. 
He says he's happy to have everybody back to the cabin to try and have a good time and recover from the death of his sisters, and that it's really important to him that all of his friends who were there that night are present. I just want you all to know, um, it means, it means so much to me that we're doing this, and I, I know it would mean so much to Hannah and Beth that we're, we're all still here together. When the characters are introduced, they each get a couple of personality traits to establish their character. Generally, the choice options that you get in the game are in character for the person you're playing as, which is a pretty cool way to differentiate the characters from one another. I will say that most of the personality traits are pretty surface level and not super descriptive. Like Sam's are diligent, considerate, and adventurous, with considerate really being the only important one out of the three. Sam makes her way down to a ski lift that will take her up the mountain to Josh's cabin, and she's supposed to meet another member of the group there, Chris. Right away, the player gets an example of the choices that can be made in the game, because Sam sees Chris's bag, but not him, so the player can choose to snoop and look at the message on his phone. Even though the choice isn't going to have a huge consequence, the dialogue that follows really makes it feel like your choices have weight, as if you do snoop, Chris catches you and will keep mentioning how uncool it is. I'm sorry, are, are you my secretary? I was buzzing. Cool, well, thanks for letting me know. I, I can take it from here. Chris is definitely the funny guy of the group as he's constantly making jokes to try and make people laugh, and clearly he and Sam already know each other pretty well. Actually, that's something that's kind of refreshing about this whole game. All of the playable characters in this game were at the cabin the night of Hannah and Beth's death, and because of this, the characters already know each other. It's pretty cool that they already have relationships and rivalries with each other that the player has to pick up on, and it forces you to look for smaller details in the way that the characters interact with one another. Chris and Sam wander the ski lift building a bit and see some remnants from the police investigation that occurred on the mountain, and you end up seeing a lot of these police clues throughout the game. As Sam and Chris ride up the ski lift, the game cuts to another character's perspective, Jessica. The game introduces her as Mike's new girlfriend, and it seems to be pretty recent because Chris and Sam didn't already know about this. Not really. Pretty clear cut actually. M's out, I'm in. Huh. It's also possible that the whole group hasn't been all together since that fateful night, which is another interesting bit of background that the game provides. At this point, characters start getting rapid fired into your face, with the introduction of Matt, who is dating a girl named Emily, who is Mike's ex girlfriend. Ah! Jesus! <laughs> yeah, I think this part goes a bit too quickly in introducing all of the characters, especially since Mike's previous and current relationship status takes a second to understand. Emily doesn't seem to be quite over Mike, because right after talking to him, she suddenly has to go in the same direction as him to meet with Sam, which we immediately see isn't true when we switch to another character named Ashley's perspective. She looks through a telescope and sees Mike and Emily hugging and generally being really friendly with each other when they're supposed to be broken up. Ashley can choose to show Matt, who sneaks up on her, what's going on in the telescope, and that can allow Matt to confront Emily about it later on. This is probably the last of the relationship building choices that I'm going to talk about for now. The beginning of this game is all about the characters and it does drag on just a tad. To keep the pacing of this video together, I'm going to skip a lot of small things that happen between the characters, so as a blanket statement, I'll say that the game does an excellent job with the characters interactions and reactions to each other, and they help to make the characters feel more real. I also don't want to go too crazy in depth about the characters personality wise because the game takes its sweet time to introduce that as well. So to wrap things up, <sighs> Sam is the level headed one, Chris is the funny one who has a crush on Ashley, Ashley is the easily scared one that has a crush on Chris, Mike is the charismatic one who's in the honeymoon phase with Jessica, Jessica is the one who acts like a confident social butterfly, Emily is the serious and blunt one who now dates Matt, Matt is the one who lets himself get walked all over by Emily, and Josh is the one whose sisters died. <gasps> okay. I definitely don't expect you to remember all that by any means, but those character relationships are basically what the beginning of the game is trying to show off. In general, the first two hours of the game are basically a teen drama, as everybody in the group makes their way to the lodge in their own little groups until they all meet there. Unfortunately, the door handle to the cabin is frozen shut, so Chris has to climb in through a window and look for materials to open the door, and this gives the player plenty of time to look around the cabin and explore. There are a ton of little references to the twins and their death, like pictures of them in their rooms and messages from a sheriff talking about the investigation for their disappearance. 
Something that I found really cool is that you can find a lot more evidence for Hannah's crush on Mike, like how she heard that he likes people that are spontaneous, so she decides to get a tattoo. It just gives a lot more context to the prologue. Chris lets everybody into the lodge after melting the ice on the door handle with a spray deodorant lighter combo, and almost immediately Emily and Jessica get into a fight, which I guess is understandable because of their relationships with Mike. It's all a big cattle call with that dream boat. Congrats, you're top cow. That's real deep calling Miss Homecoming a cow. To lighten the tension, Josh sends Mike and Jessica to a small guest cabin that's only a few minutes down the trail, and Emily and Matt go back down to the cable car to grab a bag that they forgot, which basically splits the friends into three groups. Sam decides she wants to take a bath at the lodge, so she and Josh have to turn on the water heater in the basement. Now is a good time to mention the amount of jump scares that happen in the early part of this game, because there's a lot. They try to get you with every single little thing in this game to make you think that something is actually happening. Honestly, I think it's a little bit too many, but with all of the fakeouts, it eventually leads you into a false sense of security for when something actually happens. When they get the water heater turned on, they suddenly get chased by a hooded man and the two are cornered until they realize they actually aren't in any danger. Hey. What the hell? Boom. You just got mucked. Once again, the game tries to be predictable by making it to where you never quite know what's going to happen next, which is exemplified by all of the fake outs that are thrown in. Sam is finally able to take her bath while the three remaining friends, Chris, Ashley, and Josh, decide to use a Ouija board for fun. Things almost immediately start going off the rails when the spirit board actually seems to respond to them, and it says that it's Hannah, the twin sister who was tricked, is talking to them. Yeah. I didn't do anything. It's moving again. <laughs> H? What's it spelling? Hold on. How's this happening? Are you moving it? I swear it's just moving. Oh shit. Help? Who are we speaking to? Hannah? Is that you? Oh god. <laughs> this is messed up. She talks about how there's a clue to her death in the library, and we get a first example here of how scared Ashley can get as she's utterly terrified from this board. Josh also seems to be traumatized from talking to his dead sister as he runs off leaving just Ashley and Chris together. While all that is happening, Mike and Jessica are casually making the trek to the guest house, but something seems to be watching them along the way. Eventually they start being chased by what they can only assume is a bear, so they just barely burst into the cabin and shut the door behind them. Yet. Hey, things not gonna come barging in, I promise. How can you be sure? Cause I'm pretty sure bears don't know how to open cabin doors. I've seen them open car doors. What? Where? On the internet. Really? Okay, well this isn't the internet, Jess. Jessica realizes that she lost her phone while running, but all of a sudden the phone is thrown in through the window which makes Jessica think that her friends are messing with them. Mike and Jessica were planning on getting down and dirty, so she goes outside and yells at the wood to leave her and Mike alone and she storms back into the cabin. Things aren't really given time to de-escalate though because this happens moments later. Finally, after all of the jump scares and teen drama, the tension rises dramatically. This isn't some kind of prank or misunderstanding, as she literally just got pulled through the window of the house, and for me, this is when I knew the game was finally getting serious about killing the characters. We don't get to see what happens to her right away, because the game returns to Chris and Ashley who are now searching the library to find whatever clue Hannah was talking about. They end up finding a secret room behind a bookshelf that has a letter that's talking about murdering Hannah and Beth in a creepy stalkerish way, and Ashley and Chris decide that they need to tell Josh something because something serious is going on. Unfortunately, right then they hear Josh screaming for help, and Ashley goes into the room that he's screaming in only for the door to be locked behind her and more screams to come from the room. Chris breaks through the door to try and save Ashley, but he quickly gets knocked out by a man with a strange mask on. The killer is blatantly shown to us as he drags the bodies away, and it kind of seems like this is a normalish dude in an outfit rather than a supernatural being like Jason or Michael Myers. 
After another quick therapy session, we get to see the aftermath of Jessica's situation, and we see Michael spring into action as he quickly grabs a gun and runs after her. The player gets a lot of path choices here as they can choose between different safer routes or riskier routes that have harder quick time events. Personally, I never found the quick time events difficult in general, so I always went with the risky route to be as fast as possible. When Mike catches up to Jessica, she can either be dead or just barely alive depending on your choices and your success on the quick time events. If she's barely alive, the mining elevator that she'll be on will break and fall all the way down to the bottom, leading Michael to think that she's dead. Michael tries to continue chasing after the killer, but he loses him once he finds a sanatorium that appears to be the killer's hideout. Just in case you don't know, because I didn't, a sanatorium is basically a hospital for people that have chronic conditions or are in recovery from an illness or procedure. Overall, I like this chase scene a lot. Just getting pulled through the window alone was awesome, but they added the tense chase scene with Mike that requires you to be quick and attentive to make sure that she doesn't die. It also instantly gives Mike a lot of credibility, because up to this point he seemed kinda douchey and careless, but his bravery to go out and chase a killer shows how much he really cares about Jessica and people in general. Cutting back to Chris, he wakes up and realizes that Ashley and Josh are both completely gone, and the blood splattered on the walls doesn't paint a great picture about what happened. Chris follows a trail outside the main cabin to find another small building where he hears Ashley calling for help. When he goes inside, he finds Ashley and Josh tied up to a wall in an adjoining room. Chris isn't able to get to the other side, but he can see that there's a minecart with a saw blade on the end of it that's on a track leading directly to one of the two friends. The game goes full saw mode when a voice recording starts playing from the killer explaining what's happening to Chris. Hello, and thank you all for joining me. Tonight, we're gonna conduct a little experiment. We're gonna need one more brave participant to help decide which subject will live and which will die. Chris has to choose to divert the track to either Ashley or Josh to have one of them killed while the other one lives, and he isn't given much time to decide because the minecart starts moving down the track. This is a difficult decision because Chris says earlier in the game that he and Josh have been friends since third grade, but at the same time he has a huge crush on Ashley. Personally, I tried to save Josh, I guess because they'd been friends for so long, but surprisingly even when I turned the handle to save Josh it ended up killing him anyways. I see. You may not even see this on a first playthrough, but Josh always dies in this scenario no matter what you choose. I actually had to look this up because I kept resetting to try and save Josh, but he was dying no matter what. I would say the choice isn't super clear because it has a handle that you turn onto a picture of the characters, but it's not clear if you turn the handle to the person you want to kill or save, so I feel like a lot of people would end up retrying this part because they didn't save the person that they meant to. The choice sets the rest of the game up to have similar Saw-like scenarios, so it makes the player feel like they can expect the same type of thing from the rest of the game, which you'll eventually see isn't the case. Since Ashley survives no matter what, her and Chris leave the building and find Matt and Emily along the way back to the cabin. I like how realistic Chris and Ashley's reactions are to watching Josh die. They both just break out crying, which is completely reasonable for what they just experienced. They all decide that they need to find the rest of the group and somehow get help, so Chris and Ashley return to the cabin while Matt and Emily try to find a way to get off the mountain. Back at the sanatorium, Michael is making his way through while finding many clues about the past of the mountain. The main event of the search is the multiple reports about 30 miners who had a mine collapse on them, forcing the 12 people who survived to have to resort to cannibalism. As you explore, you get a bigger idea of what happened to these miners in the sanatorium to make it abandoned, specifically that the miners seemed to have gone insane in some form and were biting people. Personally, while the clues were cool, I found this section of the game to be pretty boring. Even though the setting is cool, nothing too crazy is going on during the 20 minutes that you explore for. There are still a few things that I like, such as this trap that you can interact with that causes Michael's fingers to get stuck. There's a lot of pressure put on the choice here, which is to try and pry the trap open with a machete or cut off Mike's fingers, and there isn't a lot of time to think about it considering there seems to be a wolf coming down the corridor after you. This choice tests you to see how desperate you get in a stressful situation, as you may just cut off the fingers to avoid the dog, and when you do try to pry open the trap, it won't work at first and the same choice will pop up again. 
It takes three whole tries to open the trap, but it does work if you go all the way, so it really rewards risking it all to keep your fingers. After possibly befriending the wolf, Mike accidentally starts a fire in the sanatorium, and it fades to black after some barrels explode. When we finally go back to Matt and Emily, they make it back to the ski lift to go down the mountain, but it seems the killer already thought of that by taking away the key to the lift and making it unusable. They do see a map that shows a nearby radio tower, so they start to make their way over to it so they can ask for help. On the way there, they get trapped on top of a mountain by a bunch of deer, and the game fades away there. Yeah, that's literally everything significant that happened in that section, other than Emily just being absolutely insufferable to Matt the entire time. Like seriously, why does he put up with this? She is by far my least favorite character in the game just because she seems like a horrible person all around. Honestly, the game seems to have some pacing issues around this area. The talking and walking formula worked fine for the beginning of the game when there was no killer, but with all the crazy stuff going on it feels weird to walk through the snow for 20 minutes observing things around you. Now back to the interesting stuff, Sam is all alone taking a bath, or at least that's what it looks like before you notice the killer is literally standing right behind her. The fact that he doesn't kill her here shows that he doesn't want to murder them right away, he wants to traumatize them. Sam gets out of the shower and rocks the towel fit, but she can't find anybody else in the group. Something weird for me personally during this section was that I had a lot of trouble getting the camera controls to work, like I couldn't get Sam to move her head to look at the items, but I think the game must have just bugged a little. She wanders into the theater room and gets shown a video of her in the bath, and the video of Josh getting cut in half by the saw, and shortly afterwards the killer bursts into the room. This leads to a chase scene that's overall super cool because of how many chances there are for you to fail it. You can try to hide or keep running multiple times, and there are different don't move prompts and quick time events that keep it interesting. Somehow on my playthrough, I made all of the right choices and was able to keep Sam from getting caught, but if you do get caught, she'll get put to sleep by the killer and captured. There's another Dr. Hill segment right after this, and while I've been skipping most of them since they're very similar to each other, this one feels pretty significant because it reveals that the killer is the one in therapy. Getting back to Matt and Emily, we still see them surrounded by the deer, and you get a choice to either try and sneak through the crowd or chop a few with the axe that Matt found. The cool thing about this is that it's a possible death for Matt if you decide to attack a deer. If you attack them, he'll get pushed off the edge and have to climb back up, only dying if you miss a quick time event but if you try and sneak through instead, it works perfectly. I think it's cool how you can survive with either choice, but one requires more effort than the other. The two, or just Emily if Matt died, make their way to a radio tower and ask for help from the ranger on the other end. The ranger tells them that there's no way they can send a helicopter up until the blizzard subsides, or as he likes to put it, kind of a blatant title drop. Right when the ranger gives them the bad news, the killer seems to be attacking the radio tower by cutting off all the support beams, making the tower topple over and fall part way into a cave. If Matt is already dead, then the game fades to another character here, otherwise Matt is still on the side of the tower. Emily is on a railing that's starting to fall, and she desperately needs help, and I think it's great that the game suddenly gives you the choice to talk about how Matt saw Emily talking to Michael at the very beginning of the game. Is that why you still like Mike? He's a thinker. Matt! I don't! You and Mike are done. You get it? Yeah. Yeah, I get it. It's kind of hilarious because it's just a horrible time to bring something like that up. It seems a bit goofy to me, but it works surprisingly well in the tense situation considering I ended up pushing her about it instead of helping right away. Matt then gets the choice to save Emily or jump off the tower to safety, and if you try to help her the tower falls a little bit more and she gets into an even less savable position. It'll give you the choice to try and save her one more time, again forcing the player to make a choice based on desperation instead of logic. Like I said before, I don't really like Emily at all, so I decided to keep my boy Matt alive and have him jump to safety on the second attempt. If you do this, Emily will fall but Matt will be safe on the ledge of the cave, and if you try to save Emily they'll both fall down farther into the mines. Matt is suddenly attacked by someone, and if he doesn't have a flare gun from the radio tower, he's suddenly grabbed by the killer and put onto a nearby hook dead by daylight style. I like how when Matt dies here it's not just by falling, because that would be pretty lame. Fortunately for me, I was actually able to keep Matt alive, 
but Emily seemed to have fallen down farther into the mine since I wasn't able to save her. Back to Ashley and Chris, we see them inside the cabin searching for Sam, and this is such a small detail, but for some reason I think it's super cool how Chris cuts off his yell for Sam to respond to Ashley. Chris, Sam, what? Chris I just want to say... I don't know, the way that they talk over each other feels like something that would happen in real life. It's pretty neat and it helps the characters feel realistic. Another cool interaction between Chris and Ashley is when Ashley thanks Chris for saving her. Obviously, Ashley survives no matter what, so if he didn't choose to save her, he'll respond in a really guilty tone saying that he would do it again. Clearly, he's trying to live with the fact that she wasn't even the one that he meant to save. The two have to go into the basement to search for Sam, and while they're looking, things start to get a bit strange. All kinds of strange ghost-like events start to take place, starting with candles lighting on their own and escalating to the point where Ashley swears she saw a ghost walk by them, even though Chris didn't see anything. <gasps> Wait a minute, did you just see that? Uh, did, did I see what? That, Chris, that! What that was that? It was like, it was like a see-through shape, like a ghost. Oh boy. I'm serious. They notice strange setups, like a dollhouse that shows dolls recreating the prank from the night that Hannah and Beth died, and Hannah's diary talking about the party. It was really strange playing through this part because the game had been pretty down to earth for the most part, and suddenly it felt like it was pushing a ghost story on the player. It wasn't something that I expected when I played through the game, and honestly I wasn't really feeling the idea of a ghost Hannah getting revenge. The ghost slash killer person also shows Ashley and Chris the video that they recorded when they pranked Hannah, and something interesting to note is that Chris was asleep when they pulled the prank on her, so he wasn't involved at all. Ashley was involved though, and you can really see in Chris's face how watching how eager she is to participate in the video is really affecting his perception of her. Wow. I forgot you were such a willful oh participant. As they continue through the basement, they eventually find somebody tied up in a chair in Sam's clothing, only to realize it's just a dummy. If Sam was caught by the killer earlier in the game, she'll actually be in the chair tied up but alive, and in both scenarios Chris is suddenly attacked by the killer who puts him to sleep with gas, and that Ashley will be knocked out by the killer even if she's able to stab him with a pair of scissors. They wake up tied up in chairs with a gun on the table in between them, and because they think they're about to die they both confess their love for each other. We're always talking around it, and now, I mean, we've wasted everything. Ashley, none of it was wasted. What do you mean? Every second that I spent with you was the only thing I ever wanted to do with my time. They don't get much time to continue talking because the killer talks over a speaker explaining the next game that they're playing. Chris has the gun and he has to choose to either shoot himself or Ashley before they're cut up by saw blades, and whoever doesn't get shot gets to survive. Of course neither of them want to die, but a choice has to be made or they both die. Do you guys know how when people say that when one person is really worried about something, it makes the other person strangely calm? I think this is perfectly shown off at this moment when Ashley is absolutely freaking out and screaming and crying, while Chris is clearly wrapped up in his thoughts trying to decide what to do. I ended up choosing to do absolutely nothing based off of a choice guidance totem that I found earlier in the game, but once again the game leaves us in the dark when it fades out and shows us another therapy session with Dr. Hill and the killer. It seems that the killer had some kind of fight with the doctor because Dr. Hill now has a huge gash in his head. The doctor has completely snapped against the killer, talking about how he's gone too far playing God and that he's sick, ending the conversation by calling him a psychopath. You're sick! You're a sick fuck! Now what the hell have you done to them? Huh? What the hell have you done to them? Psychopath. Going back in time a little to Sam's perspective, we see her either be saved by Michael when she's tied in a chair, or she'll run into him from the other side of a grate. They meet up and after Sam is finally able to get some clothes on, they can hear Chris yelling from another room. When they find him, they see that Chris and Ashley aren't dead, but the killer is approaching them quickly even after being shot three times by Chris. For a moment, it feels like this person really is invincible, until the killer reveals to Chris that the bullets in the gun are just blanks, and the killer promptly reveals who he is. I mean, really? Yeah, it's freaking Josh. This is really confusing at first, and it was a huge surprise to think that Josh would really murder Jessica and knock over the radio tower. 
Speaking of that radio tower, when we go back to Emily's perspective, she actually barely survived by being tangled in a rope, and she's able to get onto solid ground and start exploring the mines. While she's trying to find a way back up to the surface, she notices some weird things, like flames bursting out of parts of the mines and shrill screeches coming from everywhere around her. Suddenly while exploring, she sees somebody carrying a freaking flamethrower, so you get the choice to hide or run away. It's super strange that there's somebody chasing her here because we just had the reveal that Josh is the killer, so where does this guy fit in? Well we get to find that out a little bit later because right as we see Emily get caught by the stranger, we cut back to the rest of the group to hear Josh's explanation. How does it feel? Do you enjoy feeling terrorized, humiliated, I mean panicked? All those emotions that my sisters got to feel once, one year ago? Only, only guess what? They didn't get to laugh it off! No! 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 They're gone! Josh did all of this as revenge for the prank that the group pulled on Hannah a year ago. Every single ghostly apparition, creepy note, and even his own fake death was done by Josh just to get back at them. He acts very strange here, and Chris even mentions how he's probably off his meds, so clearly Josh is not mentally right. Now with Josh revealed as the killer, it also means that all of the therapy meetings were for him, and Dr. Hill is just a figment of his real therapist that he made up. What is really surprising is Josh's reaction to Mike telling him that he killed Jessica. I mean, we know Josh is acting crazy, but how could he not remember literally killing Jessica? Jessica's fucking dead! What? Does that mean that the stranger that Emily just encountered is also a killer? It does a great job of keeping you on the edge because it seems that Josh wasn't the only threat on this mountain. Chris and Michael decide the best thing to do with Josh is to tie him up in a nearby shed, and on the way there, Josh completely denies doing anything to Jessica. He seems to be pretty manic, he'll say something perfectly cohesive one second, and then the next second he sounds like a clown. Tie me up now, okay! Stay still, right, man! Right, 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 still. Okay. Can't tie him up if they just wiggle around. Josh, dude! I leave me a little wiggle room, huh? Mike decides to stay with Josh until morning to make sure nothing happens to him, and Chris goes back to the group to let them know that everything's okay. Back to Emily's encounter with the stranger, she freaks out when he grabs her, but the guy gives her a flare before stopping to fight something to let Emily get away. When Emily continues to make her way through the mines, she's surprised attacked by some bony white arm, and suddenly we see a full creature come up behind to chase her. Every single person who's played the game probably had the exact same reaction at this point. What in God's name is that thing? There's no time to think about what this SCP-96 looking monster is because it relentlessly pursues Emily to the mine's exit. There's a couple of times where Emily can completely die if you miss up a quick time event, and Emily will actually be bitten by the monster if you didn't save a flare gun from the radio tower. In my case, I was able to keep Emily alive but she got bitten in the process. If she's still alive, Emily will run back to the cabin, and Michael will also return to the cabin after hearing her screams. She'll explain that there's some kind of monster that attacked her and Josh, but nobody really believes her right away because at this point they think that it's just another one of Josh's pranks. Suddenly there's a knock on the door that Michael and Chris open under great scrutiny, only from the stranger from earlier to come bursting in and disarm whoever had the pistol almost immediately. The stranger explains that the mountains belong to something called the Wendigo, and they come from a curse stating that if you ever resort to cannibalism, you will turn into a Wendigo. Well, the mountain don't belong to me, it's true. But it don't belong to the Washingtons. This mountain belongs to the Wendigo. That directly connects to the information Mike got in the sanatorium talking about the miners who had to resort to cannibalism to survive. The group decides that they need to take shelter in the basement of the cabin, but Chris realizes that Josh is now all alone in the shed and that they have to save him. The stranger says he'll help Chris just to make sure he doesn't die, and if he didn't point the gun to shoot Ashley at Josh's prank earlier then she'll give Chris a kiss before he leaves. Ah, young love. On the way to the shed that Josh is in, the stranger explains that even the shotgun that he gave Chris won't kill the Wendigo, it'll only slow it down, and the only way to fully kill it is to use fire to burn off their skin. He also says that they only hunt at night and that they see off of movement, so by staying completely still the Wendigo won't be able to see you. I think now is a good time to stop the story for a second and connect some dots. So right from the beginning, obviously Beth and Hannah were chased by a Wendigo to the edge of that mountain. When we see the fire fly through the air, it's the stranger fighting off the Wendigo that was chasing them, and he holds out his hand to try and save the twins. 
We also now know that while Josh was the one putting Chris and Ashley through emotional trauma, the Wendigo was the one that attacked Jessica and broke down the radio tower that Emily and Matt were in. I was personally very happy that they didn't go with ghosts as the underlying threat. The Wendigos are so much cooler, and it's not something that I would have expected in a million years. That's why this game subverts the player's expectations so well. The game feels so realistic and normal that something like freaking Wendigos based off of Native American folklore is equally unexpected and awesome. When Chris and the stranger make it back to the shed, Josh seems to have already been taken by the Wendigos, so they make their way back to the lodge only to encounter a Wendigo almost immediately. The player has to keep the controller completely still so it can't see them, but no matter what, the stranger is suddenly decapitated leaving Chris all on his own. Personally, I think it's kinda silly that someone who claimed to know so much about the Wendigos died so quickly. I think it would have been better if Chris had made some kind of mistake that led to his death, but even if you successfully stay still, the stranger dies anyways. Chris has to run back to the lodge while barely keeping the Wendigo off of him with the shotgun, or possibly even dying if you fail the quick time events. When he gets to the door of the lodge, Ashley is waiting at the door to let him in, but if you pointed the gun at her earlier in the game to shoot her, she won't let you in and Chris will die. I think that's pretty neat because it's not necessarily ethical, but if Chris was going to kill her earlier, I suppose Ashley decides that he doesn't deserve to be saved. It's like the railroad problem. She could open the door and save him while possibly endangering herself, or abstain from doing anything which would lead to his death. Ashley or Chris will tell the rest of the group what happened to the stranger, and Mike decides that they have to find Josh because he has the key to the cable car that will get them off the mountain. Emily, if she's still alive, agrees and explains that the mine is probably where it lives, and Mike backs it up even further by talking about the clues for the minor cave-in that he found in the sanatorium. While they're mapping out where to go to find Josh, Ashley will notice the bite on Emily's shoulder if she was bitten in the encounter with the Wendigo. Everybody in the group thinks the same thing. If Emily was bitten by the Wendigo, will she turn into one? Mike, Ashley, and Chris if he's alive decide that Emily needs to leave the bunker so she isn't endangering the group, and Michael decides enough is enough so he points a gun at her. The player gets the choice to shoot Emily so she doesn't turn into a Wendigo, or keep her alive because she may be totally fine. I was pretty conflicted on this choice, and well, I guess I just have to show you what I ended up picking. And we can't have another- We cannot risk having another Wendigo. I'm- I'm fucked- I'm- <laughs> Okay, I'll admit it, it may have been a bit of a spur of a moment decision, but at the end of the day, I didn't like Emily at all, but I did like pretty much all of the other characters, and I wasn't willing to risk the other characters' life on her. Shortly after that decision, Mike decides to go off on his own to try and save Josh and get the cable car key. Ashley finds a journal from the stranger that has a lot of information on the Wendigos, like how they can mimic their prey and... Oh crap. Does that say that the bite does literally nothing? Something that I noticed within the last hour and a half of this game is that all of the choices are going to feel like this. They feel very sudden and stressful, so it's very easy to make a wrong decision that can get characters killed. Even with me pausing to make a choice, I would still choose something so incredibly boneheaded that I would end up regretting moments later, and you'll see what I mean in just a second. Whatever ends up happening for you there, Sam decides that Mike doesn't have enough information about the Wendigos to fight them on his own, so she sets off with the group to go find him. Surprisingly, we actually get a quick therapy session with Josh and Dr. Hill that seems to take place somewhere deep down at the mines. Clearly Josh isn't dead yet, but his mental state seems to be getting even worse as he's trapped and isolated. Mike is back in the sanatorium trying to find out where Josh is, and he can find the same wolf from earlier in the game if he befriended it. Mike quickly discovers that there isn't just one or two Wendigos, it's more in the double digits, and it seems like the stranger was keeping them in cells in the sanatorium. He ends up having multiple of them chase after him, and he's barely able to fend them all off with his shotgun. Mike gains so much of my respect here by fighting off all of these Wendigos. He's obviously scared, but he's holding his own against these nearly invincible monsters. Eventually, he realizes that the only way he has a chance is with an explosion, so he shoots a bunch of oil barrels, killing a few Wendigos but also blowing up the majority of the sanatorium. <laughs> Yeah. 
Remember way earlier in the story when Michael chased after Jessica and saw her drop to the bottom of the mines? Well, if she was still alive when she fell, the game suddenly shows a scene of her waking up and grabbing a jacket before trying to find out how to escape. In my opinion, this short little scene felt really random, like why not reintroduce her earlier in the game? She had a lot of screen time at the beginning, and it really just felt like they forgot about her, and when she's finally revealed to be alive again, it's just for a 30 second scene. Alright, it's time for a quick disclaimer for the rest of the game. Pretty much all of the characters have a lot of opportunities to die at this point, whether it be through quick time events or choices, so it would be really annoying for me to keep saying, if he's alive, as a preface every time I talk about somebody that could be dead. The only person who was dead for me at this point in the story was Emily, so she won't be mentioned anymore, but keep in mind when I talk about Chris, Matt, and Jessica now, that they could all be dead in your playthrough. Also because there are so many branching paths at the end, the choices that I am going to be talking about are the choices that I made with the characters that were still alive. Okay, with that said and done, Chris, Emily, and Sam are traveling through the underground tunnels of the cabin to find Mike, but Chris has a limp and is slowing them down a bit. When Ashley falls behind the group, she hears Jessica talking in one direction, but the group went the other direction, so the player gets the opportunity to investigate the voice or group back up with Sam and Chris. This is actually a pretty clever choice because they just showed that Jessica was still alive, so it's pretty believable that she would still be in the tunnels with the rest of the gang. I chose to check if it was Jessica, and I regret to inform you that it was indeed not Jessica. Man, I feel like such an idiot after this choice because I specifically remember reading in the stranger's journal that the Wendigos can mimic human voices, but I guess that my curiosity got the best of me. Rest in peace, Ashley. You were a cool character and you only died because I was an idiot. Sam has to split up with Chris because of his ankle, and she has a sudden reunion with Michael when he brings a blazing Wendigo into the tunnel that Sam finishes off for him. Sam and Mike approach the area that Josh is in, but there's an optional clue that you can find that's Hannah's journal. It describes how Hannah actually survived the fall from a year ago, but with a broken leg she was stuck under the surface and eventually grew very hungry. She had to… eat her sister to survive, and we know what happens when you resort to cannibalism on this mountain. Basically there's a wendigo Hannah running around somewhere in the mines. Mike and Sam find Josh basically in a complete mental breakdown, and Mike has to snap him out of it. Josh has the cable car key on him, so Sam takes it and gets a boost to climb up to an exit, but Mike has to take Josh back the way they came from because he's in no condition to do any climbing. Unfortunately, Josh doesn't make it all that far, because as they're wading through the water, a wendigo with a familiar looking tattoo grabs Josh. If you found Hannah's journal, Josh will recognize Hannah leading her to drag him away, otherwise she'll crush his head right then and there. Josh is the only character that can't survive, at least in human form, until the very end, which I think is probably the best for him because he's done irreparable damage to him and all of his friends. After not seeing him for a long time, we finally get to see Matt again, who gets suddenly attacked by somebody with a shovel that turns out to be Jessica. Jessica is super beat up, so they have to make their way through the mines slowly before they start being chased by Hannah the Wendigo. Josh and Jessica can both die from failing quick time events or by making wrong decisions, but if you successfully keep them alive for the end of this chase, they survive for the rest of the game. I feel like these two characters had a lot of wasted potential. They both kind of disappeared for half of the game only to come back for a short segment that has a pretty high chance of killing them. It's likely that because they have a chance of dying so early on, Supermassive only put them in a few other scenes so they don't have to use as many resources on branching paths. At least Jessica had an extreme character change throughout the story, Matt was just kind of the same dude because he wasn't in enough scenes to have any development. For the last time we return to Sam's perspective as she and Michael meet up back at the cabin, and right as they're experiencing the calm before the storm, they see Chris hurriedly running into the cabin being chased by three Wendigos. They all make it into the living room, but so do the Wendigos, including Hannah. Strangely enough, Hannah starts attacking the other Wendigos, and I'd like to talk about some reading I did on the wiki to figure out why. 
It seems that Hannah likes to kill her former friends, then collect their heads in the mines, which can be seen before you find Josh if you have multiple characters that were killed by her. I personally think that she's either killing them to get back at them for what they did consciously, or for some reason her Wendigo mind is attacking them because she knows that they wronged her in the past. It really raises the question, do these Wendigos have any memories from before they transformed? I think they have a little bit of something, and one of the most damning pieces of evidence is how Hannah will never directly attack Michael, her former crush. As for the reason she's attacking the other Wendigos, I think she wants to kill the group herself as a bit of revenge, so she has to make sure the other Wendigos don't do it for her. When Hannah is throwing around the other Wendigos, she breaks the fireplace which causes a gas leak. This gives Mike an idea to break a light bulb and flip the switch to cause an explosion. Unfortunately, he gets surrounded right after he breaks the bulb, and Sam gets the choice to try and save Mike or flip the switch, effectively killing him and the Wendigos. Guys, you have to trust me when I say that I did not want Mike to die at all. He was my favorite character. The reason I flipped the switch is because I thought they were going to die by the Wendigos either way, so I figured if I triggered the explosion, it would at least take the Wendigos down with them. If I could go back and do it again, you know for a fact I would go back and save Mike. But that's the beauty with these choice based games. Just like real life, you can never go back. Right after the explosion, a helicopter comes by and saves the remaining survivors before the game fades into the credits. This ending by itself wouldn't be anything that crazy, but the credit scenes are what really makes the end of the game awesome. The characters that are still alive are shown going through police interviews from seemingly very soon after being saved. Each character will talk about different choices made during the game, and it's super cool seeing how some characters aren't even aware of the other things that happened during the night. One of the clips that really shows off how cool these interviews are is Mike's interview when he hears that Emily was shot when he thought she died from her fall into the mine. She was shot. What? She was what? Is she okay? We recovered her body with a gunshot wound to the head. No. It's also cool to see the characters tell the police about these Winnegos only to be dismissed because it's a traumatic event. If you haven't seen these post credit interviews, I highly recommend watching a video on them because they're pretty awesome. There is one more post credit scene if Josh and Hannah recognize each other before Josh was dragged away. Officers are sent down to investigate the mines on Sam's request, and they'll see a partially transformed Winnego Josh that attacks them. Josh must have gone fully crazy and decided that the only way that he could be with his sister is if he ate other humans. Overall, the last two hours of this game are so tense the entire time, and the total gear shift to the Wendigos as a threat is done so well. You truly have regrets by the end of the game about what you could have done differently to save a character. The fact that people die after just one wrong choice or one missed significant quick time event makes it feel realistic because we don't get second chances like that in real life. You can't take back the decisions that you make, but you can learn from them and try to come out differently by the end of it all. And you can see that apply to the characters by the end of the game when they feel like totally different people. I don't think that I've ever played a game quite like Until Dawn. It's just such an experience from start to finish, and everything from the graphics to the acting to the story is done really well. The characters all feel so different and unique from one another, and honestly with how well they nail the performances, I wouldn't be surprised if the actors are just like these characters in real life. When a game has this many characters, its biggest hurdle is going to be developing all of them to make the player feel like they know each person by the end of the game. I would say most of the characters go through some kind of significant change, like Chris becoming more confident or Michael stepping into his role as a leader, and it all feels like it's done very fluidly and naturally. For a game based on teen slasher dramas, the writing is shockingly good. There were quite a few times when the dialogue between the characters felt like something that me and my friends would say to each other in real life. I brought this up a lot in my Last of Us video, but a huge goal for a game is to make the characters feel real, and with the great performances from the actors and the subtle animation nuances that motion capture allows, it accomplishes that goal with room to spare. 
I especially liked Galadriel Steinman's performance as Ashley. She nailed the part of being a nervous and scared character, and I think the way that she acted in the game is spot on to how most people would in a killer scenario. The story of Until Dawn relies pretty heavily on what happened before the events of the game, but with the amount of clues and hints the player is given about the world, it's easy to have a basic understanding of the events that led up to the main story. I really like how fleshed out the lore is, especially how they explain the Wendigos with their complex weaknesses and behaviors. It did a great job of making it feel like we were actually getting all of this information from the stranger who studied the Wendigos for many years. The story all stems from Hannah and her transition from a nervous girl to a monstrous beast. It's incredibly sad to think that after Beth died, Hannah still survived for several days until she was forced to eat her own sister, and the trauma that her friends accidentally put her through gives her a motive to want to kill them other than just the fact that she's a wendigo. I think one of the most impressive parts of the game is how seamlessly it was able to transition between different threats. At the beginning of the game, when there was no killer hunting people down, it told a relatable story about a big group meeting for a party, and the conflicts that came with it. As the game transitioned to Josh's prank, it was a huge switch that never let the player calm down. It wants you to play detective to try and figure out what's going on, only to transition into the third phase of the game when everything is flipped on its head. It randomly throws a Wendigo at Emily in the mines with no explanation until the stranger comes by and enlightens the player on how the rest of the game is going to be. The Wendigos are a super cool concept overall, and the clues gave enough foreshadowing to their existence that it doesn't feel like they came completely out of left field. The decision to not introduce the Wendigos until late in the game was super smart, because it allows for two hours of almost constant tension at the end that is by far the best part of the game. I mean the last couple chapters were exciting and genuinely scary at points as well. The action sequences were also surprisingly fun and immersive for just being quick time events. The way they throw choices together with action buttons and shooting elements really combines to make thrilling fights with the Wendigos. At the end of the day, it's no surprise that Until Dawn made supermassive games who they are today. They had an idea for a game that they wanted to make, and they were able to push through the identity crisis it had in its early years to make a truly awesome experience. Until Dawn has a concise powerful story that shows what happens to people when they're pushed to their absolute limits in one night, and it's no surprise that the game took the world by storm and became the success that it is today. Hello everybody, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, this is me back again with the end of video unedited rant that I like to do. So, first of all, first things first, right off the bat, we have a Discord server now, okay? So that link is going to be in the description. I would love if you would join because I've already got a, quite a few people that have joined and it's just great talking to everybody. So yeah, you should join that. Um, secondly, I have other socials that I will probably link in the description, just like a Twitter and Instagram and whatnot, but yeah, those will probably also be in the description. Now, Until Dawn. Until Dawn was interesting because I had so many people ask for it, and I literally knew nothing about the game, so I had to play the game to make this video, which is why it was kind of a hard video to make, because I didn't... I didn't already know everything I needed to know. I had to do a lot of research. So, I actually really enjoyed the game, though. I thought it was really fun. It, it probably slogged in a few spots, but overall, it told a really nice, solid story that I was, like, I enjoyed quite a bit. So, um... Also, sorry for the weird music choices. All of the Until Dawn music is um, copyrighted. So I kind of had to make do with like what I had with like The Last of Us and Walking Dead. So there's a lot of those kinds of songs in there, but should be good. Overall, guys, I'm not really sure what I'm not I'm going to do for the next video. Um, I think I might do a shorter video on maybe a game that I haven't played before. Like maybe like a 15 minute video, not talking about story, just talking about overall. And I was thinking for that I could do like Uncharted or something because I've never played Uncharted. Um, then for a longer video I was thinking maybe like Spider-Man, Jedi Fallen Order, just throwing some things out there. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Um, I hope this makes any this uh, conclusion makes any kind of sense. This little rant. 
Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Sorry it took so long to get out. I have been busy and procrastinating. So, you know, that'll do it. So, thank you so much, guys. I'll see you in the next one.